we're excited. There's some big, big stuff going on. And so, yeah, anything could happen here. You know, it's going to be a fun ride. Hello and welcome to episode 66 of Great Things with Great Tech, the podcast highlighting companies doing great things with great technology. My name is Anthony Spiteri and in this episode, we're diving into a world of bare metal as a service and automation with a company that's breaking boundaries in managing heterogeneous hardware, spearheading the metal revolution. They're bringing the future of open hardware standards to the cloud, that company is Metafy. I'm speaking to the co-founder and CEO, Mike Wagner. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Anthony. Excellent. So, Mike, just before we kick on and talk about all things bare metal, just want to remind the folks out there that if you love great things with great tech and would like to feature in future episodes, you can click on the link on the show notes or head to gtwgt.com to register your interest. As a reminder, as always, all episodes of GTWGT are available on all good podcasting platforms, Google, Apple, Spotify, all the podcasting platforms out there, all hosted and distributed by Spotify Podcast. And finally, hit to the YouTube channel at GTWGT Podcast, hit the like and subscribe button to follow to get all past episodes and future shows. And with that out of the way, Mike, let's talk about Metify, um, bare metal company doing great things in the space it's it's kind of feels like it's the it's the time for bare metal cloud but before we dive into you know the founding of metify and, and why you've co-founded it with your partner maybe a bit of background into yourself and how you came to found metify yeah um sounds great so well i started many many years ago in tech um on my own just kind of dug it um as a kid and then uh in college, I started up um, with IBM uh, as a college intern, and um, I was already into Novell networking at that point. Um, and I did many inside careers at IBM. So, you know, IBM is a wonderful place to just kind of explore and do all sorts of stuff in tech. I kind of worked in almost every division I think they have right. um, over, you know, 15 years or so, 17 years, and then jumped over to um, Red Hat. I had some friends of mine that... Uh, um, left IBM and went to Red Hat and uh, convinced me to move over there. And that was a really wise move. And that exposed me to another whole segment of um, <clears throat> of business, um, specifically and importantly, the channel side of the business, which um, um, we leveraged at IBM, but a lot of what we did was direct as well. Um, you know, I ended up um, when I was a district manager for Red Hat in the Pacific Southwest, you know, we had a, a probably about an 80 20 split of direct versus channel business roughly um and um yeah so uh but red hat really got me uh deeply involved in the channel in fact the last thing i did there was kick off this um new group of uh si's for north america called the apex um, partner group and um, that group was specifically focused on um partners that could implement and provide value-added services around openshift which is their container application platform of choice um so um so yeah that's uh that's and then you know three years ago four three years ago now three and a half years ago um ian and i we were working on a bare metal provisioning solution ian evans is my co-founder and i met him because of the channel practice that we built and and the partner he was working at uh was actually one of our largest um open shift partners and uh and also one of our largest partners overall um with a large services practice so uh, we were working on a solution. Uh, he had a, an idea for a solution um, years before he even joined that company. And uh, we were able to flesh it out a little bit. And we recognized that in order to do this right, it required a startup. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, three and a half years ago, we launched uh, Metify and and here we are now. So what, what, what drew you to, you know, leaving? Because obviously 15 years at IBM, a fairly substantial chunk at Red Hat. Yeah. You know, what, what, what made you go, yep, I'm going to go out and try and, and start something. Was it, was it the idea was, was, was that compelling? Did you, did you see the yeah. a, a white space that was in the market for it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I was always, so this concept of side gigging, right? I mean, you know, I think for the entrepreneur, uh, I think a lot of folks have an entre entrepreneurial spirit, you know, and I certainly um, have one. And, and that's kind of one of the cool things about, um, 
you know, where we are now as a, as a culture even, mm -hmm. and the tools that are available to everybody, we can all kind of, you know, um, uh, go after things in, in different ways. And, um, uh, so for me, I, I always wanted to start my own company. I always envisioned myself as the CEO of my own company and, um, you know, there was a few close calls, uh, but it's a it's an alignment thing, right? And mm. obviously, um, with a family and kids, I wanted to make sure that uh, I chose wisely um, before I I dove into anything. And um, I had a couple of very you know really close calls from a um, product and positioning perspective where I could have launched in other directions. Had a couple offers to do something along those lines. Yeah. Um, but um, it just wasn't what I was looking for, and and specifically what I was looking for was something. That was a, a niche software solution um, that uh, really had a chance at disrupting something big. I didn't want to do it for a, a, a hobbyist business or a lifestyle business or whatever you want to call it, yeah. you know, where you can kind of, I wanted something that could actually, you know, find something that disrupted things. And um, the cool part about working in, um, in, in this kind of advanced channels position where you're working with the best SIs around is that you really do get exposed to exactly what's happening at the application level, as well as with with Red Hat, of course, all the way down to the OS and the difficulties that are yeah. um, that are you know part of dealing with OSs and and BIOSes and all those things that have to happen at the server level to make everything else work. Just before we get into that, because I think that's obviously one of the problem statements that Metafast trying to trying to solve, right? Is what you just talked mm -hmm. about there and the whole concept of how hard it is to actually provision a server and then what the public cloud actually meant for that and how there's been a bit of a pullback back to, you know, having some sort of server that you control at that bare metal end. But I just want to go back to the side hustle. You mentioned an interesting thing there. It definitely is the era of the side hustle, right? With the tooling that, that we have available. And I guess the thought, the thought of a lot of, the, especially the younger IT guys um, around yeah. that their first, sort of um, thought processes. I'll do my day job and see what I can do at night to get me to right. that side hustle. But you mentioned a good point there that you didn't want it just to be a hobby or some sort of half, if I could say half-assed sort of um, attempt to do it. You, you really <laughs> wanted to, to make sure that it was going to be something that had reason and, and could change the industry. And I think that's it's a very important sort of thing to consider when anyone's deciding to go into a side hustle. You, yeah. It's, it's got to be... Yes, you can do a bit of a play thing, but don't expect it to be putting, you know, like you said, food on the table for your family. It, that's going to be a consideration. So, you yes. know, what what was so pressing about the problem statement then that gave you that spirit of conviction to be able to go and start it? Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in many ways, um, so Ian Evans, uh, my CTO uh, and co-founder, he's just, uh, he's a brilliant guy. And uh, so when he came uh, to me with this solution um, and I, we started diving into it a bit, I could see his passion, first of all. Um, and that's incredibly important. And, and I love hardware as well. So we were, you know, sort of double geeking out on the potentials of this solution. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, he just I mean, the first day I was just so blown away. I was like, oh, my God, OK, this could be disruptively different because it brings so many um, needs into a single, very simple to use tool, um, and it's completely neglected. Uh, so <clears throat> when I think about the things that I noticed, so we have deep expertise in this area, right? I've, I've been in the cold rooms and seen data centers and helped plan data centers of, you know, some of the largest companies around as has Ian. Ian's done it very directly. You know, I had services teams that were doing it yep. um, at IBM for Ian. He, he did it. You know, I mean, he had to live it and and build it. So he was the the, the lead principal architect on on a lot of these. Um, so you know that's critical, right? Having deep expertise in the area and and seeing, feeling that degree of excitement because you know the area well enough to know, holy crap, everyone is going to get this. And then we had validation of it because we kind of built a uh, an alpha version, if you will, um, and that was in fact you know a big part of what I was working with Ian on was like an alpha. What could we build? Because solution development, this was something I was always um, trying to push at Red Hat was it's it's more than our products. What is the best solution? What are we doing with our partners to build something that customers actually use beyond the operating system or beyond Ansible or, you know, mm. beyond, um, you know, any of our uh, core products that uh, that our customers rely on. Um, so, and that's where, uh, that's where this idea of a bare metal provisioning solution, leveraging Red Hat tools 
um, came into place. And and we had a chance to alpha this this with several of the top 100 customers in North America. Um, you know, we're talking Fortune 100 customers, uh, the largest financial institutions, some of the largest um, Department of Defense groups, um, manufacturing organizations, um, aircraft builders, you name it, we got to show it to them. And they all literally were just like, okay, this is great. Where can we buy it? Right. We couldn't, okay. there was no product, you know, so we were stuck and we're looking at each other like, oh my God. Okay. And then a lot of the guidance that we got from those customers who are, they know their pains, you know, better than anybody. Right. Um, so a lot of the guidance that we got, it, we, we knew we had to do this as a startup. We just, we could not show any, um, you know, sort of, a. uh, uh any tie-in to any of the big players, HP, Dell, any of the hard, big hardware players, any of the big software players. We just had to be this neutral Switzerland mojo, mojo platform. We had to be yeah, the Switzerland right. platform, if you will, that I, I could think, allow yeah. that low-level magic to happen. I think that's the point where you realize that it has to be something you go all in on and you kind of risk you know, elements of your career on and, 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 and yeah. your being and what you're doing. And if, you know, the family, <laughs> food, food on the table, we went, we go back to that. Uh, I think a lot of yeah, people, yeah. a lot of people don't have the spirit of conviction to be able to make that jump. So the, the yeah. fact that you saw that and you were able to go in and, and go all in, it's quite credible. So let, let's talk about Metafire. You, you've talked kind of a little bit around about what, what is Metafire? Like what, what is, what is the product? What are you guys achieving? Yeah. Um, so, well, it's an award-winning, um, low-level infrastructure and operations tool, really like an old-school utility platform. I remember the days when you had utility programs, or you know, we still do, but just don't use them as much. Um, and uh, so we created just, and we made that we wanted to make it incredibly simple to use because currently um, infrastructure and operations kind of got left in the dust, frankly, because of the proprietary nature of, of servers and the protective importance of monetization of the software um, that, you know, the big OEMs relied on Absolutely, and still do yeah. rely on. Very important for them to shift that into um, subscription stream, stream revenue of some kind, right? Be it maintenance or um, software to, to manage those servers, right? It's a very big part of staying profitable. Um, and we appreciate those guys. And, and believe me, the hardware platforms uh, do have a lot of, I mean, there's a, a lot of gold in those uh, OEMs with uh, the things that they provide above and beyond white box servers, especially for um, less um, technically advanced organizations. Um, but um, we were focused on simpleness and and the discovery, um, provisioning, and, and really maintenance of any uh, server platform, regardless of the manufacturer, uh, regardless of where it was, we could remotely um, discover, uh, provision, and enable um, that device, regardless of where it was. Which is, which we actually call them endpoints, yeah. because it can be a server, it could be uh, some type of edge device, it could be a sensor, uh, it could be okay. a, a palm top, you know, whatever. Um, and that's you know, with the um, with the dawn of the edge, if you will, um, and and the growth of that, and uh, all that's happening around the edge, uh, it turns out you know it's an incredibly important thing to be able to do, um, yes. especially. And I think the key to all this is it's in in a lights out fashion. In other words, it's out of band. It doesn't matter. All we need is a uh, if there's power going to the device, right? It's got power, and there is a uh, some type of network connection that's you know that we can establish uh, through. Um, you know, Ethernet or or wireless, whatever. Then we can low level, you know, update firmware, update BIOS, um, wipe out the hard drive, put in a new OS, uh, load a new software stack, update the OS, whatever you can imagine from a low level um, maintenance perspective. And operation. this is all this is all really because there's been a little <clears throat> bit of a move. Obviously, we was a big shift. There was a big shift to the public clouds, right? That was. I talk about it often on this podcast, the panacea of what it was to say we're, we're moving everything to the public cloud, um, on-premises is dead, the cloud is where it is. And we've we've definitely seen this concept of repatriation, especially this year. It's been a, been a, been a big word this year, like it's happening a lot. Mm -hmm. There's been some very famous um, posts and articles out there about some big orgs that are pulling back from the public yeah. clouds and, and, and going back you know, to on-premises and back to buying servers and boxes and whatnot. But you mentioned it earlier there's we've, we've there's a bit of a dead patch or a dead zone 
between you know what what it was to provision a server the operating system and then virtualization came on and kind of almost superseded the the hardware in, in terms of thinking about what we needed to do on the hardware um, if you're new to if you're new to computers and servers or computers and serverless or whatever it might be today you don't really understand what it is to have a, a, a physical box right so <laughs> you don't even yeah. know let alone how to yeah. upgrade a bias or a yeah. firmware or anything but you're still critical it still happens like even if when you're in the public cloud that that all still happens right so yeah that hasn't gone away but i think yeah. when we've pulled back so we've now we're now pulling back to on-premises bare metal has become obviously very popular i've noticed that in the last 18 months to 24 months the bare yeah. metal clouds have become front and center and in fact quite a few traditional hosting providers that might have been doing virtualization infrastructure as a service have actually pivoted to offering bare metal as well so you know where does metify fit in in, in that world yeah so that's the the beauty of our our platform um is that we we have um sort of uh private label services so we work with hosters right to help them um monetize bare metal and create their own bare metal clouds for their customers um, as well as providing it directly to um, enterprises so they can uh, DIY. Uh, so, and that all depends, that's a skill set thing, right? So we, we really, um, having a channel led business, it allows us to cover all those bases. Um, and, um, you know, our, some of our partners have uh, bare metal as a service um, offerings now as well, leveraging Mojo, um, as well as build services, leveraging Mojo, because you can also um, just use it to to build the servers and then ship them out to whoever oh, yeah. uh, to to their customers. That's pretty Absolutely. cool. So yeah. Mo Mojo yeah. Mojo is the platform, mm -hmm. and then Metify is the, is the company name. So where where Correct. did Met, where did Metify come from? I'm always interested in the origins of of, of company names. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Metify is a portmanteau, uh, a combination of the words. Uh, so it's bare metal, metal, and simplified. And so metal, metal simplified, metified. Beautiful. There you go. Yeah, so you came yeah, up with it. That's awesome. Yeah. It's not made up. It's actually it actually means something. It means something. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and that was you know that was important too, right? We just uh, we wanted people to know this thing is real, and uh, yeah. metify made sense for us. So yeah, yeah. And Mojo is is the actual platform, or the, I guess you called it a tool, a tooling or tool set earlier. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a platform. I mean, um, because there's a lot that goes into it, and there's a lot that we can do with it. So we have a service catalog, that's also a part of it, dashboarding and monitoring um, of of um, all of your endpoints. So uh, yeah, it's 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 truly a platform in that um, you know there's a number of components to it, and um, you know there's there is a, a lot. We we kind of led everything from a security first posture, um, which is really required. In fact, we've got some. Uh, work with the DOD right now that's um, specifically related to um, a new uh, specification or new certification from a security perspective, okay. um, a, kind of the secure platform um, specification, secure compute specification. So some really cool stuff coming. And uh, yeah, all of this speaks directly to cloud repatriation um, and uh, you know the ability to handle these things um, on your own but in a, in a very secure way. Um, so, and, you know, the DMTF, which is the open standard that made all of this possible, mm -hmm. um, it, the open standards group, the actual standard is called the Redfish specification. Redfish? Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Redfish made it all happen. Um, and, uh, you know, once all of the OEMs got on board, that's that's what enabled all of this to uh, to occur and, and allow us to do our, our magic and, and provide... Um, solutions both from a hosting perspective right so to tie this back into uh the question um you know having the ability to uh manage to to discover provision and manage um you know a low level from any manufacturer is uh incredibly powerful and that gives you that that bare metal um solution if you will yeah. if you're a hoster okay cool now we, you have the tool set you can use it and we have, you know, special pricing for that. If you're a customer, you can just download it and install it into behind your firewall. And then you have your own sort of bare metal as a service solution, if you will. And now it's just the, uh, it bare metal has become the dominant um, architecture for containerized applications. 
Yeah. Um, and there's a number of reasons why that's the case, but yeah, it's 52% now of, um, containerized workloads are actually running on bare metal. Well, okay, so. cool. And yeah. you would have had early, you know, from a containerized point of view, you've worked in OpenShift quite early in, in Red, Red Hat career, right? When it was kind of there, thereabouts. I, I know that OpenShift, mm -hmm. you know, to a certain extent dominates a lot of the enterprise containerization yeah. space these days. Um, it's just a great solution, very robust yeah. platform. So, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. In terms of the open standard point of view, so I remember back, it's, it's probably like, it's got to be more 10 years ago. I remember the open compute platform was out, was out there making waves. That was more about a data center in a rack and specific, specific sizes of the compute and the racks and the servers, putting it in there. And then it was tied to hardware and software and whatnot. Is this an evolution of that in terms of Redfish and the MTF and the open standards? Because it's all about low level APIs, right? Um, is, is that yes. an evolution or was that a, was that a separate part yeah. that didn't quite take off? No, it's, it's, it's definitely, they, they work together uh, very well. They, they kind of evolved together. Um, so I wouldn't say that one is taking over from the other because the open compute project specifies a number of things that uh, Redfish is not, does not care about, right? So, you know, the size of the rack and, yeah. um, you know, different things along from a pure physical perspective. Now, everything that's in that um, rack, of course, is uh, interrogatable um, and uh, usable. And um, OpenBMC also flows with the Open Compute Project um, often. And and that's another standards organization that we work with that um, has also um, gotten on board with the Redfish specification. So they um, coexist and uh, and all of this is sort of backward compatibility or bilateral compatibility between the two of them. They work very closely together. Um, so yeah, it's all uh, coming together really beautifully and and you know we get to work across the board with um with all of them including then there's others too you know snia has swordfish which is the storage component um there's a yang to redfish model for the networking stuff um you know there's just all of it is coming together right this uh this desire uh to be able to fix your own diy and not be um sort of proprietarily stuck um with any one manufacturer has driven all this and yeah. uh you know obviously the use cases um demand it so pretty cool so with, so with in terms of the the value and the, and the benefit of of the platform so when mm -hmm. you when we talk about a complete life cycle compute <clears throat> storage network um we've got the rest api there for for control um we've got yep. low level bias updating and rollbacks um is that kind of we talk about low level simplicity is that yes. really the, the major benefit of this platform it's that it takes away a lot of the pain points that traditionally have yeah. come with managing a server absolutely and it, and initially i mean that was the number one pain point describing i mean we talked to organizations that had to put off and had is, major major outages and issues because they had to put off updating their servers because it was just so manually strenuous to be able to update all the bioses of yeah. thousands of systems um you know we're talking the 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 hand jam as um kevin backman called it um from uh, major league baseball uh you, you know so one of our uh, really awesome customers um and uh, uh there's there's no getting around um, the manual process that's involved in in doing low level things like this unless you have a, a new tool and uh, yes so that was uh, one of the big things that that drove it in the beginning um, and then it evolved from there um, because there's also we also recognized uh, this need for governance security maintenance audits right what's the reporting associated with uh, who's touched that server okay. right so we have a full chain of custody that's built in. And so the idea of server lifecycle management coupled with um, a secure, loggable, auditable platform, that's incredibly important. And it just, there was, we, we couldn't find anything like it. And, and Ian, you know, was always saying, God, I wish, you know, I had this because it would make my life so much easier. And, you know, just from an audit perspective, we talked to a few customers that it, it takes them it used to take them months and months to prepare for an audit. And now, you know, with Mojo, you just spit out a report and you know exactly who's touched that server, exactly what BIOS levels are on it, any changes that have been made, everything is kept up um, uh, and, and uh, you know, reportable um, that touches Mojo, that, that Mojo is is managing. So yeah. it's, a, it's a huge value add. Yeah, Beyond, that, yeah. I was going to say that hand jamming of, I've never heard of it before. It 
sounds yeah. kind of like dangerously it's a dangerous word <laughs> right it's, it's, yeah it's, it's a bit edgy but i um i get yeah. it because i i was one of those guys that for all my career would have to you know manage a fleet of servers and think about oh my goodness here's another bias update we've got to pump it out to 70 80 servers now that's that's not an easy task okay let's, let's roll through them um yeah and it was always a pain and, and to, to that extent because it, there was that pain associated with it Sometimes you'd put it off and put it off dangerously so, right? Because yeah. I think this probably happens today, potentially less because we've got a lot more regulations and compliances and whatnot. But I know that my thought process was if it ain't broke, don't fix. And some of these servers, you know, we wouldn't upgrade the firmware or BIOS on up, up the That's right. too hard. So, yeah. you know, with this platform now making that easy across the board, um, you don't yeah. have those problems. And then what happens is those problems will will basically build on top of themselves as well because if you've got an mm. old firmware then you're going to have a new os that goes on it the os has ca compatibility issues right. you're always playing catch up at that point so i feel like this potentially solves a lot of those roadblocks a lot of practitioners had back in the day yeah yeah you're describing sort of the cascading uh failure issues that come with putting off um low level updates and uh, yeah, and then it becomes difficult to to know what you have in the field. Um, so we have uh, so one of the big use cases that we are finding ourselves working with large customers and in and mid size as well on is we're getting placed in their labs. So all the testing um, of the architectural footprints that are in the field, um, they get to make sure that everything is up to date and everything works perfectly before it gets shipped, um, and then. Um, and shipped, I mean, you know, downloaded and updated and everything working, right? Um, now, that could include a hardware um, upgrade as well, but for the most part, it's it's software. Um, so we get to update all those things and, and, and inside the labs, they get to test across all of the platforms. Usually, and it, it can vary, um, but then the important thing is what's in the field, okay? So having that um, remote ability to do a low level discovery of all of the BIOS levels, all of the firmware levels. So you essentially have a, a gold image, if you will, of what it's supposed to be. And then you run a report against that um, within Mojo. And then you you know look at, okay, here, these are the boxes. Oh, we got one in Cleveland that uh, needs to be, that's on the old BIOS. So we know it will break if we try and roll this upgrade out. Yeah. Um, or, you know, similarly across the board, you can you know do this with thousands of servers. and. Um, that's incredibly valuable. So especially with the with the growth of edge and everything that's happening out there, keeping track of um, uh, what's actually in those servers, what's in those um, you know small edge devices uh, is just critical. Um, you know. Yeah, I was going to say how the sphere of you know what is compute today is, has changed massively. Uh, it's yeah. changing quickly. Um, so what what defines the edge for you because i know that the mlb case study from well you know you're one of the customers you mentioned major league baseball they yeah. moved away from <laughs> vmware and they've got this their stadiums and they had certain compute platforms in there and they've shifted mm -hmm. away to a containerized based platform and you know yeah. you guys are managing that low level aspect of that so how uh, just talk a little bit about that the, the, and effectively what's happening out there and using mlb as a as a pretty good example of what's going on yeah. Um, it, it, yes. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. Major League Baseball is a perfect use case um, that is a true hybrid edge um, cloud solution, as well as a tie back to their data center also. Um, so they've got sort of a, you can almost view it as a hub spoken cloud um, perspective as an architecture. Um, and um, yeah, they were, Kevin had this hilarious thing I'd never heard before called, called the hand jam where, you know, they'd have to fly around to the stadiums and their edge pops, you know, their edge points of presence were uh, five servers um, inside of each ballpark. And depending on the ballpark, it had, uh, it was a either, you know, slightly better or worse class citizen. Sometimes it was a closet. Sometimes they had a nice room. Yeah. Uh, you I know, can it imagine just yeah. Yes. You you know exactly. Yeah. Because each of the it's, it's the, the other part that's interesting, right? Um, all of the ballparks are owned by the you know the, by the individual owners. So you're kind of managing an independent fleet, if you that's will. A, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a harder deal than um, 
uh, like uh, like retail, you know. And I'm I'm surprised we still um, we're we're in some um, early beta with a, a few retailers, but we haven't done a major retail rollout yet, which is I'm I'm shocked by because the use case is perfect for us. But I was going to say um, I can think of one of I can think of a customer that is is one of our customers that I work for that this would be perfect for. It lends itself yeah. exactly to what you're talking about. Maybe we should yeah. talk afterwards, but I'll <laughs> take that, that offline. Sounds great. <laughs> well, as, speaking of, you know, it's funny because this is why we actually took in the funding because we have to get our name. You know, people need to become more aware of what's going on, even though, you know, we've had Major League Baseball and some other really big customers. Um, there is a, there is certainly a um, competitive advantage aspect. So we can't talk about some of our customers um, and, um, you know, MLB was kind enough to uh, promote, um, you know, and and publish, and they actually have a tech blog where they published us and, uh, yeah. you know, put a graphic up with um, where I we just quickly on that. So the seeding, so 1.5 million a couple of months ago. Um, so yeah. that's obviously pretty big. And you're looking to kind of work work on that. Obviously, you've just talked about a bit of maybe a bit of marketing, a bit of realization of the market, but also trying to improve the experience. But that yeah. lends itself to the fact that for the best part of well, four years, you were bootstrapped, right? Which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Three years, three years of bootstrapping. So, and that's another reason why I had to be really sure uh, that this could disruptively <laughs> yeah. change things. You know, I, I had uh, saved up a few money, saved up a few pennies and, um, and actually, you know, crypto, it, because we're also working with um, uh, some players in crypto okay. and um, that made it possible for this, right? I, I made, um, I was a, um, an Ethereum miner. I made, you know, had a couple of rigs and made, a few dollars extra along with my, you know, saving up cash over my professional career. And, um, That's you know, awesome. so that, yeah. So, you, yeah. so you're, you're, you know, uh, I, I missed out on the early days of Ethereum mining, even though my, my old boss, he said, but Ethereum, 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 I didn't listen to yeah. him and I missed out. But anyway, yeah. so, so you've, 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 you're able to kind of leverage a bit of crypto yeah. foresight and use that to basically bootstrap. That's awesome. Yes, it de it definitely helped. It wasn't the sole contributor, but yeah, it was a, a nice. It made me feel like okay, I've got enough here that I know I can give this a good run. Awesome. And um, and yeah, the goal was too. I didn't want to give it away because we really were confident that we had a, a solution here that would immediately you know uh, provide value for our customers. So just go so back yes. to yeah. So just go back to the MLB use case and and the quick yeah. transition from VMware to what you guys are doing and what they're doing now in a nutshell. Yeah. So in a nutshell, um, yeah, that was kind of the uh, the problem statement for MLB was um, they were they felt they were paying too much for their um, virtualized environments, um, and uh, it also wasn't the architecture of choice. So it wasn't money wasn't the sole reason, but it certainly was. I mean, you know, this this move towards containerization creates uh, a much cleaner platform to deliver your applications on when you can do it with bare metal. And you get better application performance. You get uh, lower latency. You get uh, better uptimes. You know, there's a number of positive benefits that outflow from getting your architecture right. So this virtualization not only was expensive, but it also um, negatively impacted their application performance and overall uptime. So what do you do to... Um, now, granted, there's an ease of function benefit, but when you're uh, technically proficient and and capable and in this case, well, with Mojo platform, um, it makes it incredibly easy to do all the things you need to do um, and still uh, save a bunch of money in the process. So you get, it's it's a win-win in, in every way. So yeah, the problem state for them was, okay, let's, let's try and be able to have a centralized point to uh, manage and provision, discover, manage, provision, all of our edge pops, all of our edge points of presence, um, while partnering <clears throat> with Google to be able to upload um, all the data into GCP, into Google okay. Cloud Platform, um, running the applications on Google Anthos, which is a competitor to OpenShift and uh, another one of the enterprise um, application platforms that uh, sits on top of that, that, you know, is Kubernetes based. Um, so yeah, that was the, you know, the main problem statement, right? They had to get on bare metal. They wanted a, a way to, um, you know, uh, ongoing in an ongoing manner, manage and provision without flying out and and doing the infamous Backman hand. Well, Kevin Backman's uh, word there, yeah. the hand jam. Yeah, I'm doing it now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So it is funny when I was at no when I was um, a Novell engineer with IBM, we called it sneaker net. That's it. I don't that's know. What I, that's what I knew. Yeah, that's that's what. Yeah, I knew sneaker net was the only term. So it was hilarious. I, I mean, he's South African. He's got some of the funniest sayings you've ever heard. 
Um, <laughs> that uh, probably that probably actually makes sense now in terms of yes, yeah, it makes yeah. sense in terms of where it came from. Okay, <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. Uh, so um, so yeah, so it's uh, so, so yeah, it covered all the bases for him, and um, we were able to implement it very quickly. And uh, you know, in a few weeks, we kind of had it done. In fact, it was um, as soon as they saw Mojo, and this has been. A, very repeatable experience they just were like okay does it does it really work this easily you know and they're like right. yeah and I'll, I'll never forget the vp said okay so their vp of it it was kevin's boss uh, felipe uh, negron um said to me is there any okay so is there anything it can't do <laughs> you know kind of jokingly but kind of serious i'm like there's a number of things on our roadmap that we really look forward to getting in but yeah it can do all this stuff and um so it, it was, uh, it, like I said, we, uh, they actually said, let's uh, skip the POC. Let's put it straight into production. And we were oh, cool. um, landed and operating within a few weeks um, and had their ballparks up and going. So, and now we're in there. We've grown every year with them um, and they've been a customer for, I think they're in their third year. So right. um, uh, now we're in their minor league parks as well. And, um, you know, that continues to to grow. They've got a lot of different minor league teams. So makes their uh their lives much easier across the board now not just in the major league ballparks but also across uh yeah. the other states it's full it's full automation isn't it so it's, it's mm -hmm. like it's the automation of something that is fundamentally um a manual task the, the walk yes. up the sneakering the hand jamming all that kind of stuff so that's pretty cool quickly talk yeah. about the restful api and infrastructure as code i know that you plug into you're 100 rest focused obviously that's it's very important the yeah. tooling out there, I assume, plugs into all, every infrastructure code out there that's possible, that's popular. So to that end, anyone who would be using any type of Terraform, Ansible, whatever, Chef, whatever it might be, they can yeah. plug into your system and basically do this thing. Yes. So, and that was a that was a big value point and something that Ian was um, really excited about. He said, "Okay, we're not going to use any of these garbage old." Uh, methods right now uh, we want this to be modern and uh, a modern tool that treats infrastructure and operations as a first-class citizen and um, really brings a, a disruptive level of simplicity to these tasks that uh, uh, infrastructure has to deal with so yeah the, the restful nature of all of that and the api for everything um, way that we built Mojo Platform uh, really enables uh, that degree of simplicity as well as as security and um, you know allows you to do things that just weren't possible five years ago. Yeah, you know? it, I mean, it allows it's... everyone to consume it as a cloud, and that's kind of the yeah. important thing. And we we, we right. moved to cloud, and I think the end result of cloud is that people wanted to consume as cloud, but not necessarily necessarily have to deal with the public cloud. So that lends itself <laughs> to to the service yeah. quite well. Hey, just just finish off with uh, yeah. where where are you guys going? Like where where are you going to continue to innovate and disrupt the market moving forward? Yeah. Um, so in the short term here, the big thing is uh, we're going to be downloadable. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, we, we've been getting a lot of requests for, um, because as it is right now, you go to our website and it's you, you know, you can click for a demo, um, but you can't just download the product and, and kick tires on it and play with it. Right. So um, the downloadability is something that we should have online in a couple weeks, two weeks or so. Excellent. So we're really, yeah, really excited about that. And that's another reason um, Titletown Tech and uh, um, our, our VC investment is helping us get there because it's a significant um, uh, lift for us from a development perspective. <clears throat> so um, that's happening. Um, we're also, you know, developing more on the, on the network front, which is, which is really fun and on the uh, wireless broadband front. So um, we have another product, um, called Photon, and that's a, a broadband wireless solution that is um, best in class. It's just a really cool solution that we helped um, teachers out when COVID hit a couple of years uh, ago. Um, awesome. Ian helped out the local community and, and got these teachers online so they could teach their classes. Awesome. And uh, the tech that resulted in that was really cool. All right. Well, Mike, that was a great conversation. I think what you guys are doing is amazing. Uh, Metify is definitely you know, riding this this awesome wave that we have at the moment with bare metal, but you're doing it in, in quite a unique way and you've obviously had some great success. So thanks for being on the show. Uh, and just as a reminder, if you love great things with great tech we'd like to feature in future episodes, you can click on the link on the show notes or head to GTWGT podcast or gtwgt.com 
or go and find me at Anthony Spateri or at GTWGT Podcast on Twitter. And with that, thanks to Mike and thanks to Metify for being on episode 66 of Great Things with Great Tech. Pleasure being here, Anthony. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, mate. All right, man. You got it. Have a good one. <laughs>